Hey guys, welcome to today's class. Have fun. Welcome back guys to uh, Literature in English, which is um, taught in preparation for the West African examination. Having treated figures of speech and literary devices, we're going to start with the poetry aspect of the examination. Now we have African poetry and non-African poetry, but today we're starting with African poetry and according to the syllabus, there are five poems written by African writers which were selected for this section. But we'll be treating two today. I selected those two because I think they're very interesting and relatable. And hopefully we can thoroughly analyze them and find out the major features and the message behind these poems. Now, the very first one we're talking about is The Panic of Growing Older, which is written by Larry Peters. Now, at the first look, you realize that this poem has eight stanzas and it basically talks about growing up. Like, it's literally what the title says, The Panic of Growing Older. So let's go and have a quick read. The panic of grain holder spreads fluttering wings from year to year. At 20, stilled by hope of gigantic success, time and exploration. At 30, a sudden throb of pain, laboratory tests have nothing to show. Legs creeped in domesticity allow no sudden leaps at the noon now. Copy books bisected with red ink and failures, nothing to show the world. Three children perhaps, the world expected of you. No specialist effort there. But science gives hope of twice three score and ten. Hope is not a grain of, of sand. Inner satisfaction dwindles in sharp blades of expectation. From now on, the world has you. Before we go into proper analysis, let us look a little bit into the writer so we can understand where he's coming from. The poet's background, Larry Peters was born in 1932 and he died in 2009. He wrote the poem, The Panic of Grain Older, in 1967. He's a Gambian writer, poet, singer, broadcaster, and surgeon. And he has gone past his 20s, 30s. So we can see that he has experience to write this poem and explain things he has gone through based on his experience. Now, the reason why we look at the background of poets is because it gives us a mind view, a view into their mindset at that time. It also helps you understand their background, perhaps why they wrote it. It, uh, it also gives us a perspective into the stage in which they are in at their life right as at that time. So sometimes it could also be because of the political realities around them. So in this case, Larry Peters was, in this case, Larry Peter has, has achieved some things here. He's, he's actually a self-made man at this point and wrote it at his, within around his 30s, going to 40 basically. Now, despite the fact that this poem really sounds very pessimistic, he died an achiever, yeah? So, but then as at this point, of course, he didn't know how his life was going to go. And then this poem is trying to give you, give everybody basically a full point of what life could be. Now let's talk about the structure of the poem. 
The poem, like I said earlier, is written in eight stanzas, in very short phases, and arranged chronologically to describe the different phases of life. You can see that it starts from the birth, the early adulthood, adulthood till it got to the old age. The very first stanza describes the aging process, which the poet thinks is it spread like fluttering wings from year to year. So it's it's really slow because I mean it's just like a butterfly that is trying to like it is it, trying to flutter its wings and it just goes slowly and slowly. Now back to stanza one again. It already started about talking about the anxiety which is faced at this time. But at stanza two, which has the early twenty, the poet decides that there is so much surge of hope and high expectation at this point because time is on your side in your 20s, in, this, in the early 20s. And when I think about it now, 20s is probably the time when you're done with the university, so you're expected to get a job, or you could still be in the university, yeah, but you're looking forward to, to finish probably your medical degree and get a job because the reality in Nigeria is once you've gone through education, then you have the chance and opportunity to better compete and probably make it in life for yourself. Stanza 3 reveals that by the age of 30, you realize the troubling pain. And this is because there is a sudden surge of disappointment and discouragement. Because why you spent the age 20s with so much expectation and ambition by 30 you just suddenly eats you that okay you, you start feeling the pain of disappointment and discouragement slowly creeping in by the fourth stanza it talks about legs creeped in domesticity allow no sudden leaves at the new now now this is a slow decline which talks about the manifestation of the aging process so you lose your agility and witness that sin i can imagine at this point is probably the age the eight late 40s going to the 50 when you're getting to the noon like you get into the noon stage of your life it's no longer morning because you've progressed right now the fifth stanza dwells on the realization of failure that sets in. The fifth stanza says, copybook by setted with red ink and failures, nothing to show the word. At this point, the poem is going into a bit of languishing at talking about the failure at this point. Because even though you started with so much excitement in the beginning, now finally gone into a descending other feeling where at this point the poem the poet is describing the discouragement you feel here in the sixth stanza the poet considers that he has nothing to show the world except the children which it doesn't which it does not see as an achievement three children perhaps the world expects it of you no special effort there so you see that having children is not special even though i mean Sometimes children are considered as achievement if you have to go through a difficult process having them. But eventually, it's not really special when you have children because the, the part here is talking about the fact that he, he is obviously desires something else as an achievement. By stanza 7, stanza 6, the poet considers that he has nothing to show for the for except children and by seven he muses that now is getting to the later end of his years and it's like science gives hope of living up to 70 years which is what he meant by twice three score and ten twice three score that's 60 and 10 so science gives the hope of 70 years of you living up to 70 years but is not even sure of achieving that fact and I can bring that to the present reality in Nigeria. The mortality rate is not even close to 70. It's like around 60. It's around 50 something in Nigeria. So it's saying that 
after realizing so much discouragement, so much disappointment, then you are uh, the point that the point where it's considering that okay, am I even going to live long enough to meals and to to get to the stage of regretting or to 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 reflect on how disappointing life has been. In the final stanza, which is the eighth stanza, it, it portrays the old age where the poet has thought of unfulfilled dreams and aspiration, which brings so much weakness to his mind. And at this point, the poet acknowledged that you have no much time left. And because the body is weak and feeble, you don't have control over yourself anymore. I mean, most people at their old age, they can't even pee for themselves. They have to use a cutter and you need assistance moving around. So it's like you lose, you lose control over yourself. And here, the poet basically just resigned to fate because from now on, the world has you. Which means, I mean, people control your movement. Sometimes you ended up being kept, you end up being kept, uh, kept you know, old people's house old people's own and then the world as you basically you, you resign to fate and it's just like waiting like whatever happens I'm ready to take it now that is the general analysis for that poem now the mood and tone of the poet started is very passive and it's calm even though it's really disturbing because it's, it's talking about something that is very kind of depressing but it depicts him because in a way that he has resigned to fate and it's it's a very overly pessimistic tone there is it wasn't optimistic at all the only part where there was a little bit of optimism was the second stanza where we're talking about the aspiration of your early 20s but then it quickly descended to him talking about how those aspirations and dreams amount to nothing by the age of 30. Now let's talk about the themes. We have the main theme here, which is the fear of growing old or growing older, which is clearly stated in the title, the panic of growing older. So there is so much fear because you realize that as we gradually get to each tensor, the poet is describing an, an older age, like, which means by each tensor, the person is getting older and each time the orb falls lower. By 30, there is already physical uh, physical pain and loss of agility. So already there is that fear of, okay, once you grow older, the end of it is death. And even before you get to death, you can't control your life anymore at the old age. So there is a fear of aging and there is a fear of aging without achieving much or achieving little. The second one is pessimism, which I've discussed over up. There is no optimism in the voice of, in the tone of the poet. The poet is more about, the poem is more about fear, anxiety, um, lack of interest and lack of hope, basically. The third theme is, I've kind of discussed that with the first theme, which is the mortality of man. So eventually it talks about the fact that you're still going to die at the end of the day. So despite your aspiration, your dreams, and the disappointment, it's going to end in death at the end of the day. So even though that's a very, a very, um, it, it's a salient theme in this poem. And the third theme here is the uncertainty of life. So even though the poem stated and started with being very, uh, a little bit optimistic in the 20s, it talks about how it's very, really uncertain. So, I mean, even though this poem is also very, is, is not very cheering, and it talks about how everything could really just go wrong, in reality, you could be reading this poem and everything goes completely opposite for you. You probably grow up and you win a Nobel Prize, you become a celebrity, you become a, a popular person that will bring in a major breakthrough in science or in art, or you become the president and you bring in development, infrastructure and 
proper governance to the country. So basically, it's really uncertain. Even though this poem took a very downward turn, life is very uncertain. Now let's talk about the poetic devices. Here we have um, poetic devices, even though in the previous lesson we talked more about figures of speech and literary devices. Here, that is basically what the poetic devices is referring to. And the first one is metaphor. We have in the first time they're talking about fluttering wings. It's like fluttering wings. So it describes anxiety of aging, but yeah, this is a, a metaphor basically. So even though it's it says fluttering wings, a word which is not in any way related to old age, it's basically describing the process of aging. The anxiety of aging. The second um, device here will be symbolism. The poem makes use of symbolism in so many ways. It talks about the sudden trouble of pain. It talks about the weakness of the body generally. Legs creeped. It's talking about like your, your legs are limited probably in pain because you're aging. Like the older you grow, the less agile, the less active. You become your bones become a little bit stiffer and you become a little more tired you're not as agile and energetic as you are at your younger age it talks about the hope of gigantic success time and exploration here this is symbolism for the youthful age where you have so much time you're optimistic you're adventurous and you want to explore everything and you're ready to grab success by your neck if it presents itself and also we also have copybook here which symbolizes the plans and goals you set out to achieve in life so you can see that even though it doesn't clearly state these things there this is basically what they symbolize it the next poetic device will be repetition the word repeat uh, the word hope is repeated in stanza seven twice and even though it also features in stanzas too. So even though the, the, the emphasis on hope here is basically talking about how, I mean, that is what you have so much on, but later on it gradually declines and the hope fades away eventually. And we also have alliteration here, which is also in stanzas one, where it talks about, um, spread fluttering wings from year to year and that is uh basically all i'm bringing out in this poem but the overall summary again will be about talking about the how life could be it could be uncertain you could start with so much dreams and then it just takes a very downward turn and it can be nothing like you expect but, like I said, we can take comfort in the fact that even though Larry Peters felt this way when he wrote this poem in 1967, he died an achiever. He achieved everything. I mean, we're treating this poem now, which means he died as a very successful poet. And when you think about his background, he was a writer, he was a poet, he was a singer, he was a broadcaster, and he was a surgeon, which means even though he was more in the field of hack, he also became a doctor at some point. So, I mean, despite how very depressing this poem can be, it didn't exactly turn out the way uh, Larry Peters felt about his life. Like, his, his life actually took a very different turn. And, I mean, we're not there at this point of his death, but we can conclude that he died an achiever. And that brings us to the end of the poem, The Panic of Grain Order. Um, if you have any question or you think you want any other additional um, uh, themes or analysis, you can ask your questions in the comments section and we would discuss that. Now the next poem we will be looking at is The Anvil and the Hammer, which is written by Kofi Awuno. Now, I think this is also a very interesting poem, and I'm going to start by 
um, reading it. Cuts between the anvil and the hammer. In the forging house of a new life. Transforming the pangs that delivered me. Into the joy of new songs. The trappings of the past. Tender and tenuous. Woven with the fibre of silks are. And washed in the blood of goats. And the fetish art. Are laced with the flimsy glories. Of paved street. The jargon of a new di dialect comes with the charisma of the perpetual search on the outlaw's ear. So the whole days for us, our fathers, that we can wear them under our new garment. After we've washed ourselves in the whirlpool of many rivers, Asturia. Asturia. We hear the songs and rumors every day. Determined to ignore this, we use snatches from their tunes. We make ourselves new flags and hunters. While we lift the banner of the land and listen to the reverberation of our song and the splash and moon of the sea. Now, before we go into the analysis, I want to give a, 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 a literal imagery of what this poem is about. Now this is what they mean by the anvil and the hammer. You can see the anvil is this platform and the hammer is lying just on top of it. Now the anvil and this hammer is a tool used by the metal smith and I mean, when they're working, they have a piece of metal in the middle, and then the hammer basically is um, um, is used striking the metal, trying to create it into the desired shape of the blacksmith or the metal smith person. So this is what you what you should imagine when they say the anvil and the hammer, and off the top of my head, we can basically talk about the fact that this poem is saying you're caught between the anvil and the hammer, which is um, is talking more about the person or the people stuck between this anvil and the hammer. Now, before I go more into the analysis, let's talk about the background of the poet. Kofi Awuno, born 13 March 1935 to 21st September 2013, was a Ghanaian poet and an author. This poem was written at a time where Africans were assessing the impact of the conflict of dealing with the local and foreign culture in the life of the African. There is apparently a clash of emotions rising from being the center of the mismatch of interactions between African and European culture. Basically, this poem was written during the colonial era. For context, the polo, uh, colonial era is, was when the period when um, Europeans, which is like the British, the French, the Portuguese, uh, the Spanish, the Germans, they invaded Africa during the scrabble for Africa and took different countries and different regions as their as their um, as a colony basically now at this time if you look at the time when uh, Kofi lived he lived during the time where the colonial powers were still in Africa and when they transferred power back back to our leaders like during the independence basically so yeah um uh, so yeah, Kofi lived through this time, even till to 2013. So he has so much experience of what it was like being born into colonialism, then living to see Africa regain independence and the aftermath of, of colonialism. So the setting here is the colonial times, where the traditional order has been displaced by the foreign culture which is completely foreign, like contradictory to the old culture that was in place to the status quo. 
Now the tone and the mood of the poet at first started as a bit of lamentation, but then by stanza two it became a bit of nostalgic feeling which the poet was expressing. And at the later part of the poem, you see that the, the tone changed to more of accommodation and acceptance. At first, the poet was lamenting this new foreign um, culture, this sudden westernization and uh, modernity, in quotes, that happened to Africa during that time. And then he reflected briefly on how it was when it was all good, when when it was all good, when they could, um, when they could wash in the blood of goats and the fetish arts and the best, basically the previous glory of Africa back then. And finally, it came down to a bit of accommodation and acceptance that, okay, it's too late. This culture has already invaded and it's time to like accommodate and accept it. So basically, this poem went through a bit of it's basically a mood of conflict where the poet talks about the conflict between this completely different cultures coming together and being forced well the new one being forced on the africa so the african has the default culture his own heritage his own indigenous beliefs and culture and values and now he has to 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 maintain that at the same time deal with this new invasive foreign culture now we can go quickly to the analysis. This poem itself is a metaphorical poem. Like the anvil and the armor itself is a metaphor. The anvil and the armor, like I discussed earlier, is used by the blacksmith to shaping metal into form. So yeah, we can talk about the anvil as the African culture. And the armor is the new Western culture. Kofi is a Ghanaian and were colonized by... The British. So in this sense, we can assume that the foreign culture can be the British culture in this context. But of course, if you're dealing with some other countries, let's say you're talking about um, uh, Togo, then of course the Ama will be the French culture because they were colonized by the French. So yeah, the anvil is the African culture and you have the foreign culture which is trying to, to strike the african or the people who in this case will be the metal they're trying to strike them into shape so now the poet is saying that okay the africans we are you're caught between the two you're caught between your old culture or which is your own culture the african way of life and this new one which is trying to 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 forge you into something new entirely in stanzas one the poet starts with the dilemma. He talks about being caught between the anvil and the hammer, found in the forging house of a new life. The new life is a new in which the Africans are subjected to and they have to ex experience the pain of transformation, as in the new birth. Now, the forging house here is talking about the schools and the churches, which is basically where westernization is spread through education and religion like back in the colonial time there were a lot of churches there were schools because that is like the play that those were like the instruments according to this poem that the forging houses were uh where the africans pass through and they get to learn about the western culture the western way of life god save the queen and stuff like that and that's why i mean if you read some books you realize that so many families were against sending their children to school as at back then because it was seen completely as a tool of westernization and as a tool of of uh, of, of domination the same thing with what the way the religion was perceived back then standards to reflect on what life was before the transformation which the writer has a very positive feeling to us and he feels that it was a very good time he laments the um, erosion of the African identity by the way of life and by this Western values. By stanza three, it calls for the balance between African and European life, European culture, by sustaining 
the African culture while still living the European way of life. Yeah, the poet accept that, okay, you can't do away with this foreign culture which has been imposed upon you, but at the same time, it is not ready to allow the African culture to get eroded and to get, like, dominated and suppressed, supplanted by the foreign culture. And that's why he said, so the old days for us, our fathers, that we can wear them under our new garment. So there's a new garment, which is the westernization, the western culture, but then still want to like have Africa deepening, still want to have what it is to have that African identity, that your indigenous culture, your indigenous values and beliefs. Now, the next answer says, we hear the songs and rumors every day. Determined to ignore this, we use snatches from their tunes. Make ourselves new flags and our terms where we lift the banner of the land. Here, it focuses more of the acceptance that I spoke about. So, hearing about the songs and the rumors every day refers to the Western education and the perception that the Western education and the precept that targets the African way of life because it sees African way of life as inferior, as barbaric, and that is what the poet is referring to here as their songs and their rumors. The songs and rumors that uh, that, that target the African way of life. So it, the poet here dismisses them as rumors that they are a misrepresentation and misinformation about what the African way of life is. But at the later part of that same stanza, he talks about a synergy between these two cultures. So even though there is so much conflict for this African having to be armored between the armor and the hand view, I think that you can take on the Western culture, Western education values, while still staying true to your roots, while still keeping your African identity. And at this point, the writer, the poet already embraces this. So why it starts with lamenting, oh my God, our African identity is getting eroded. At this point, there is an embrace. There is an embrace and instead, the poet calls for a bit of taking ownership. So he's saying, even though they have songs, we can snatch the tunes and make it our own. We can make ourselves new flags new anthems and while we're doing this we also lift the banner of the land so eventually when you do that it creates a balance and even though it's br it brings in a new african a new african that has passed through colonization and westernization it doesn't completely rip apart rip away the identity of the african it just creates a new person and in the final stanza the poet turned on a note of optimism, talking about the preeminence and the resilience of the African culture and the values over the foreign lifestyle. So even though the foreign culture came in to like overtake and supplant it, the African culture is really resilient. So even though we have Christianity, we have um, the new cultures, we have the new education, we've taken ownership of it and we've made it our own. We still wear our native attires to work. We don't stick to the Western way of dressing and what we do. We still sing our songs. We still use our P. Okay, a very good example is language. For instance, Nigeria, the, the white man came with English and then making it our own, we made it pigeon, which only we ourselves understand, right? So I, I think that's also another thing of, um, African culture being resilient to the it, being resilient in the face of a new language. Basically, you're able to like take ownership of it and make it your own and create a new balance while still maintaining our own indigenous languages. And um, before I go leave this analysis, I will say that there are some analysis that this uh, decide that this poem is just two stanzas, but here I would say that there are like five stanzas four regular ones and the last one is a bit irregular in the sense that it's just two lines so five stanzas but i would advise that depending on what's your 
your um your formal tutorial insisting you can go with the number of standards but in the end of the, at the end of the day it doesn't really change the message of the poem now let's go to the teams the prevalent theme here is the clash of culture we're talking about the traditional the indigenous culture to africa and the western one which is coming to overtake it so we've already spoken about um how the the armor keeps striking on the indigenous or keeps striking on the indigenous people on the and uh, on the anvil which represents the traditional culture and the african is caught in between getting molded by this action now the second theme is the delima in the beginning there is so much delima for the new africa there's delima of maybe you should get assimilated into this new foreign culture or you could resist and hold back to your own obviously during colonization there was so much assimilation effort by the colonial masters that it's very hard for you to completely resist them and at this point delima is so strong in the sense that while the western influence can be so overwhelming the delima for the african year was trying to stick for what he knows what has always been his own culture and trying to pick on on this new foreign culture you know this new foreign this new religion that is very alien to the people and that is why there's a delima here so assimilating integrating or like keeping those two values side by side and the third team here will be the nostalgia for the african heritage which was really prevalent in the second stanza the poet feels so much for wanting to have what was status quo before the colonization started really missed what it was when things were great where there were no foreign influence where our culture and our heritage was enough for us was our own definition of civilization because i mean we were civilized people but without trying to tune ourselves to what was the interpretation of civilization by the western culture so yeah we were never barbaric we were, we're just our own people we're just different and even though you're different was seen as evil and the western culture which was the foreign one was seen as the good one like you know the good one coming to overtake the evil one and yeah it's it's not really true because that's what the western culture wanted you to believe but then it still state that oh you can hold steadfast steadfast to your um african heritage because it is what you are and another theme here is the theme of transformation so there was a very forceful fusion and it was explained in so many words here it talks about the transforming being like the pangs of child bed. it talks about the wing while pool of many rivers estuary estuary and then it talks about how it how things were like really difficult in trying to like assimilate these people to this new culture now let's talk about the poetic devices which i said I, is still the same as talking about the figures of speech and the literary devices the metaphor here which i've explained earlier cuts between the anvil and the armor is a metaphor on its own so as i said the poem is metaphorical and the title reflects that the line the past tender and tenuous the past woven with five and seesaw the past washed in the blood of gold they are all examples of metaphor written in the lines of the poem onomatopoeia is in the splash and the moon of the sea the moon in, in, in the splash and the moan of the sea basically um the next we have oxymoron flimsy glories which are very contradictory to each other so a good example of oxymoron there 
and we have alliteration. Trappings of the past, tender and tenuous. Basically the TT, the trapping, tender, tenure. Alliteration, of course, repetition of, of consonant um, of words starting with cons consonant letters. And then we also have symbolism. Now there are a lot of uh, symbols used in this poem, which um, describes the two distinct culture. I've, as I've repeated, the anvil and the anvil represents the African culture, while the armor represents the European culture. And now let's talk about imagery, which I think was a poetic device was a, te a te literary technique that was employed a lot in this poem. We have the imagery of childbirth, which is talking about like the transforming pants that delivered me. Of course, when you, when you read that line, you have a mental image of someone giving birth in so much pain and agony here. And this pain and agony is trying to describe what the African had to go through going through this process of transforming from the um, what he or she knew, the African tradition, to trying to take in this new European foreign culture. And now we have the imagery of violence. Violence here depicts the pain and the trauma the African tradition had to be subjected to as a result of its contact with the European culture. Now, some of the examples here will be in the line that of course talks about the pangs that delivered me. Then it could also be in um, the whirlpool of the many rivers, a story. Then here it talks about the, the process, like after we have washed ourselves in the pool, like the, the process, the trauma of having to go through this process, it's, it gives a, a bit of imagery of um of violence and next we have the imagery of nationalism so and that is in the fourth stanza so even though it, it talks about this dilemma this new conflict between the old and the new it's saying that we can embrace this for ourselves, we can be resilient, and even though we're making new flags and new anthems, they are our own. And at the end of the day, it is all to lift the banner of the land. So at the end of the day, the country, the tradition takes, it takes preeminence, the, the, the nation takes preeminence. So, and I think eventually you can talk about the wave of uh, independence that happened at the end of the day. So even though colonialism came and endured for a while eventually countries african countries got their independence and we made new flags for ourselves before before now nigeria didn't have the green white green flag but we made it even though we never had it and we were forced to create that because of colonial colonization but we we're able to like make it our own we we're able to like fashion our own flags create our own anthems that does not say God bless the queen. We're able to talk about, uh, create an anthem that talks about us as a people and encourage us as a people and that celebrate us as Africans. And so that will bring us to the end of the analysis for the anvil and the armor. So even though it starts with so much lamentation that, oh, our culture got eroded, we got in this new foreign lifestyle, which is actually what happens when a people are colonized and suppressed by a foreign power. The African culture stood resilient, or more like the poet is encouraging us to to hold the African culture above this new foreign one. And I mean, as you can see, we still, if you can look around, you see that we still have um, our African culture raised high above, even though I would argue that there's still daily conflict between our culture and the foreign culture, because I mean, the foreign culture is all around us. We build our houses in the European style. We use um, we use the language as the Ligue Franca. We try to standardize according to the Western way. But then 
this is still a reminder that we can still old top our heritage we can still make everything our own it's too late for us to completely subtract westernization from us but we can embrace it and make it our own we can refashion it into our own in a way that it's lift african culture i above us thank you very much and this will bring us to the end of this analysis of these two poems and like i said if you have any question i'll be glad to answer any questions you may have on these poems and by next week we could continue with african poems or we could just treat the non-african poems thank you very much and i wish you success as you continue to prepare for your exams i hope the class was interesting if you have questions, please drop them in the comment section or send us an email. We would love to help you further. See you in the next class.